Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Nicholas Eric. Yes, we do. And y'all, it is so good. Like sit back with a cup of coffee and a pen and paper because you're going to want to get every morsel of this great information. It's really good. Yeah. He has some really good points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We talked about branding and we talked about a lot about leveraging your time and your books Mm -hmm. for long-term success. Mm -hmm. And he had some really good points and said things in some new ways talked about tropes Mm -hmm. and how to use genre if whether you want to write uh, with a pen name Mm -hmm. or you just want to write in the same genre but kind of write different uh, subgenres within Mm -hmm. a single genre is really good Mm -hmm. and reducing friction between um, how sometimes when you're not writing to brand or you don't, your brand isn't really clear. It creates friction for the reader. And so how that's not great. So yeah, yeah. it's really good. Really, really yeah. good. Um, so what's been going on with you? Um, well, I've had some family stuff going on, just had to go out of town and do yeah. some things. And I'm trying to get some things done, more project management than mm-hmm. actual writing. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like I am fighting against the current to just get mm-hmm. anything done. It's just been a couple of days where it's like, I could just get this one email sent, mm-hmm. I would feel like I had done something. So mm-hmm. it's that kind of week and yeah. it's fine. But um, um, I'm also taking a, a course from Becca Syme about intellection. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting. And I hope that I will have some more time to think about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> then I will get much more to out use of it. that intellection. Yes. Yes. <laughs> to yes. Kind of put it to work. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. What about you? What have you been doing? Um, well, waiting for my book to come back from my editor. I've, I've done some admin things all week and uh, gotten some things done and set up and then had promos set up for the release and then changed my mind. <laughs> and so was able to cancel them. Thank goodness. Uh, cancel one of them because um, at one point I had two books free and I just thought that's too much. So I'm going to wait and mm-hmm. I'm going to do one book free and then we'll see how the launch goes. And um so yeah, that's been a lot of what I've been doing, just launch stuff, um, getting ready. I've got to write a blurb. Oh, um, but I did get my book back mm-hmm. from the editor and she had some really great things. It, she just really loved the book. Of course, the manuscript itself looks like it bled to death because, uh, you know, that's totally normal right? stuff. Yeah. Like for me, that's <laughs> totally normal, but it's totally normal for everyone. Yeah, I got it, it really not around 11, 1130. And, um, I'm not, I had to have, a, a endoscopy. I can't think, I can't say that right. Yeah. Endoscopy. I don't know that, you know, where they go know, to, sounds throat, good to me though. your stomach. I don't know, but they have to put you to sleep. So one of the things it says, one of the <laughs> things they tell you is do not sign any important paperwork or drive, you know, till tomorrow. And so I figure I should not work on my book. <laughs> if I can't <laughs> sign important paperwork, I shouldn't work on my book either until I'm not uh, maybe a little fuzzy headed. Uh, so, so, so like, I'll jump or, in tomorrow. Yeah. or you highlight everything well, that yeah, you, exactly. and then you go back and check it, but you're such a trooper. <laughs> I mean, to do a podcast recording in the intro and everything after that, you're just, yeah, Oh, that, well. I, I do admire that about you because you just just get it done. I, just, I don't know yeah. how you do it. If it was me, I'd be like, I can't do anything for a week. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I gotta recover. I know. So other than that, that's really all that's going on around here. We're just uh I'm watching the second season of Ted Lasso. Every it's only coming out once a week and it's killing me, <laughs> but it's been really good. And um, yeah, other than that. Just, I've been waiting on my book. So now I have it back and I mm-hmm. uh, got the cover reveal image from my um, book cover designer, you know, where mm-hmm. it's oh, like yeah. ripped when you yes. see part of it. So I got that. So I'm going to put that up. I think, I think I got to look at my schedule, but I think next week. 
And mm-hmm. but before I do that, I have to write a blurb again with the blurb. Yeah. So, Sometimes I think blurbs and like the synopsis, like mm-hmm. if you ever have to write a synopsis, those are oh, yeah. so, so hard. Well, I mean, and it's, it's so funny to, yeah. because like the book will come out and somebody will post a review and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's, that's perfect. Just encapsulates <laughs> the gist of what the book is about. Why could I not see that? It's because we're so close to it. It's, and like, we're all down in the details. Yeah. yeah. So I was trying yeah. to think the hook, what's the hook? What's the hook? I almost emailed my editor and said, to ask for what's that? And then I thought, you know what? I really should know that. That's not yeah. really something I should ask her. I've already, she's come already up with done something. enough. Yeah. <laughs> you should come up with something to send it to her and say, what do you think? Do you think this encapsulates the book? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's it's done and I'm very proud of it. You're feeling relieved, aren't you? Yeah. 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 And I am very proud of it. It's it's a good book and it's a fun book, funny and fun mm-hmm. book. So um I'm I'm happy about that too. So anyway, well, we should get on with the with yes. the interview with Nicholas because he has such good stuff to say. And um I know you guys are gonna really, really like it. Yes. All right, sounds good. So here we go. All right. So today we have Nicholas Eric with us. Hi Nicholas, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. We're yeah. so glad you're here. I know this is going to be a great interview. People are going to really, really get a lot out of it. Yeah. So let me read your bio real quick. Nicholas Eric is a science fiction and fantasy author who has written over 20 novels. His, for his fellow indie authors, he writes comprehensive guides on how to sell more books, build your fan base, and be more productive, which we all want yes. all of that. <laughs> we want it all. Yep. <laughs> Well, and I can say that uh, I've uh, been a client of Nick's and he is great and super professional and um, yeah, just really easy to work with. So let's get started with questions. Uh, How did you get into writing? Well, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that. And basically I graduated college and decided at some point that I was going to write a book, I was just kind of deciding what to do. So I don't know exactly what the thought process there was, Mm -hmm. but I just started writing that. And I guess about four or five months later and a bunch of rewrites, I had that first book done and just haven't stopped in the nine years since, I guess. It'll be nine years. Yeah. That was, that's amazing. And was it one of your, it, it was an urban fantasy book or was it a uh, fantasy? It was not a clearly defined uh. genre. So that's <laughs> one of the things that I didn't really realize at the yeah. beginning yeah. that people really read in pretty specific genres right. a lot of the time. So I think as writers, we often have more eclectic tastes mm-hmm. than a lot of the readership or a lot of the readership that's going to drive your mm-hmm. career, which uh, are often referred to as whale readers or just really avid readers who are mm-hmm. reading three, four, five books a week. Mm-hmm. They often have certain subgenres that they like and certain things they're expecting in the books. And I just had no concept of that at the beginning. So mm-hmm. technically it's a science fiction book, but that's kind of a loose definition. I thought that science fiction, just everything was the same. If you like sci-fi then you're going to like everything. And that's mm-hmm. definitely not going to be the case. There's very clearly delineated lines between say space opera and then something like post-apocalyptic or mm-hmm. really anything there. So there will be crossover, but I didn't really have an idea of how yeah. those lines broke down. Right. Yeah. How I did, did that you, too. <laughs> how did you find, how did you come to realize that? Did, was it, just something that after that book didn't really hit the mark, you figured it out or did, did, were you in a class or. That would be good. If it was right after that book. <laughs> I, it took, uh, it took a lot of books uh-huh. and I'd say probably maybe like up to the 12th or 13th. Mm-hmm. Like I had an idea of mm-hmm. what the genre was, uh, and what it entailed, but I didn't really have the exact right idea. One series that I did a few books after that was kind of this old school type of pulp Mm sci-fi series. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it actually hit that 
market, but there wasn't a huge market for it. It's kind of like a Doc Savage type of mm-hmm. book. Um, and maybe that'll make a comeback because they're making a movie starring yeah. The Rock. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that might make a comeback. But at the time, it certainly wasn't a super popular genre. So I did actually get that genre and writing to market, whatever you want to call it, down. But I didn't have the actual whole right. yeah. idea, yeah. which is to sell books to people who are reading things now, right? Like give mm-hmm. people what they want mm-hmm. now rather than 80 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Very That's good. very common. I think I, especially like I did the same thing with my first indie books. I just, I had all these uh, books that had inspired me years ago and they were older books. And I tried to write in that same type of genre. And uh, yeah, there's lots of us that are hoping that certain sub genres will come back. <laughs> they may never come back. <laughs> so what is your definition of success? It can be a lot of different things. Usually I'm working with clients or giving people some sort of marketing related advice in my newsletter, or the marketing books or courses or something. So usually that's going to be monetary mm-hmm. where you're trying to hit X. And then I think a subset of that or not necessarily a subset, I would say that the money is a subset of just your lifestyle and what you want that day-to-day looks like a lot of people have set up their businesses in a way where they're just going to constantly be writing X number of books every year where it's a book a month or every two months or something like that. And that's great if you want to do that, but you can make a lot of money and be successful from the outside and everybody can look and see that you're doing well. And there will be people who are jealous or envious of you, but they probably wouldn't be envious of the amount of just constant production that is required. So if that's not something that you enjoy, then that would probably be unsuccessful. Even if you made half a million dollars or million dollars or whatever would be traditionally successful. So I like to think of just like, what do I want my day-to-day life to look like? Mm -hmm. And you might not be able to get there today, it might take some planning and effort, you know, it might be a year down the line, two years down the line, but hopefully you spend most of your writing life or at least a good part of it, having your days look something like you want them rather than this treadmill or this endless Mm -hmm. array of work. And if you love writing and you love writing a book every month or something like that, then that's great. People definitely like doing that. I think a lot of people don't and then they get stuck where they can't let off the gas. Otherwise everything kind of falls with their earnings and stuff like that. That's true. Yeah. And then you have to course correct and when you and course correcting can take time. Mm-hmm. And then and th- and that's stressful, you know, mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Because I do know some people that have have written really fast and a lot of books, but you know, can't keep it up. And then when they pull up, you know, let off the gas, they do see a dip in income. They've realized now what they would rather have, but that's a stressful time to have that course correction happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It it makes me think of um, Trisha O'Malley in the interview we just did with her, where Mm -hmm. she thought about how she wanted to set up her, how she wanted to live her life and what her perfect day was. And then she created her writing life around that, which is kind of the opposite. I think a lot of us were like, we know we have to hustle in a way to get those first books out and get established. But then it's, some of us aren't built to do that permanently, you know? And so like, we kind of have to transition into a more realistic lifestyle for us than the right book a month or whatever. And that can be, that can be challenging. Yeah, it really can. What do you wish you'd known about writing and craft? Probably a lot more than I did at the (laughs) beginning, right? But that's, that's just part of the the game and getting better and stuff like that. I think the main thing that I really needed to learn was story structure. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how important that was to just give the reader kind of milestones to hit and um, 
landmarks mm-hmm. where they can tell where they're in the story, even if they don't have any idea whatsoever about writing craft and the story structure exists. Mm-hmm. Everybody can sense when it's going well with the pacing mm-hmm. and things like that, just from reading so many books and also watching movies and television shows, you can kind of tell when something's off and you might not be able to use the words that a writer or a screenwriter or whatever would use to describe it. But the end result is that people stop reading or they're unsatisfied. So I think that that's probably the most important thing because first you have to get the people to the end. Yeah. Even if your writing is great, even if the characters are really interesting, like if people aren't hitting the end, then they can't, pick up your next book. They can't join your newsletter. You can't build a career and Mm -hmm. they're not going to become fans of your work. So it's almost taken as a given that once someone buys the book, that your work as the author is done or your marketing work as the author is done, but it's really just beginning where you need Mm -hmm. someone to consume what you've done. And in today's world with so many options between other books, Netflix, video games, Mm -hmm. whatever else people do right now that we can all go outside (laughs) again, um, you know, like you're competing with a lot of different Mm -hmm. media and also just hobbies and other things that people can do. So you really have to drive people forward and get them to read the book and nowhere is that clearer than in Kindle Unlimited where you can see the page reads start to rack up or not, which Mm -hmm. some authors don't like, but certainly if you're starting out, then that's a good kind of gauge of how well you've hit the market or how many people you're getting to the end. Like Mm -hmm. it's a rough estimate, but if you're not seeing those people get to the end, then it's an indication that things aren't going as you might like, and you can't tell if people get to the end, just in case anyone's wondering there, but if you're not seeing like, you know, the page reads going up as you're advertising and as you're putting out more books and as your fan base is growing, or it's not really, there's plateauing a lot, you know, at a very low level or something, then that's something that you can dive into a bit more. Yeah. Like when I see my ranks on my subsequent books, you know, book two, three, and four, when I see them not moving, after I've had, you know, some pretty good sales on book one, I'm like, hmm, maybe, maybe I need to go back and check those links in the back matter or something like that. <laughs> because that's a, to me, that's a good indication because you really can't tell if they've read to the end. Um, but if they click on to the next book, you can. So that, that yeah. is uh, very good. Yeah, that's a good point about uh-huh. m- like monitoring your Kindle Unlimited reads, you can find out how things are going You in general, you know, whereas if you're like, I'm wide, so all I really get, are, all I really get are sales mm-hmm. numbers. And, but then if you get, you know, subsequent sales, then that's a good indication too. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, what about marketing? What do you wish you'd known about marketing? The genre thing is a big one mm-hmm. where that's where everything starts. So if you kind of miss on that at the beginning, then you can't go back and change that. It doesn't matter what you do with the marketing. It doesn't matter how clever you are with the ads or anything else, or you have this crazy promo strategy that no one's ever tried and it's going to blow the doors off everything. If the product itself doesn't resonate with people, Mm -hmm. then you're going to have a really difficult time selling it. So on that topic, one, a professional cover doesn't necessarily mean on genre. So your cover needs to signal the genre. Same thing with the blurb. You can write something that has the right structure and is quote unquote technically good, but doesn't necessarily sell books. The title is really important. That's something that a lot of authors overlook or they try to get lyrical or cute with the title. If you look through your subgenre, then you're going to see really what the expectations are, right? When you're writing cozies, most of the titles tend to be puns. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. just the genre trope. And you can deviate from that somewhat, but if you're way off in left field and pulling something that's really aggressive, like a thriller (laughs) title, you know, then it's going to miss the mark. So those type of things, the series title as well helps and all those together help just 
throw up a flag to people who are interested in that genre yeah. and say, Hey, come check this out. And then, you know, hopefully the book delivers from there. But I'd say that that's the biggest part of marketing that just, I certainly missed and that people miss and try to rectify later on, but there's no real way to fix that other than writing a new series. Right. If the first one is just completely missing the mark or mm-hmm. kind of off base there. We're going to talk about branding a little later, but, but I do want to ask, how would you, you said something about, you said just having a professional cover doesn't guarantee you're going to have a cover that hits you know, the genre expectations. How would you suggest people do that research to figure that out? Go to the Amazon top 100 in your subgenre. You can just type that into Google and then start scrolling through and start getting a feel for what the indie covers look like, what the traditionally published covers look like. You want to be careful with the traditional stuff just because sometimes they choose things that maybe it's going to look good in print Mm -hmm. or just it might not really be on genre at all because Mm -hmm. the author themselves just has a massive fan base and Mm -hmm. people are buying it for the name on the cover rather than what the cover itself is signaling. So the goal of branding and everything you're doing hopefully is to eventually get people to buy Mm -hmm. the book because your name is on the cover, but that's usually a pretty long ways off. Yeah. Especially when you're starting out, like no one knows who you are. So yeah. You have to look at what other people are doing. And I try to describe it as fitting in while standing out. So you want to <laughs> mm-hmm. be similar enough that you're not out of place, but you also need to catch people's eyes so yeah. that you don't just blend in, which is, it's a tricky balance yeah. to get. And it's really easy to skew that too much one way mm-hmm. or the other, but yeah, I would check out, Amazon and then scroll through it and save the covers that appeal to you and get you to click on the book and kind of look at the similarities. For example, in urban fantasy, which is what I write, there's going to be a lot of people with glowing hands Mm -hmm. on the cover. That's just a universal signal for urban fantasy. You don't necessarily have to do that. My latest book doesn't have that on it, but as you get a better idea of what's possible in the genre. You can kind of play off those tropes and signal the same things in slightly different ways, which is how you stand out a little bit. It's kind of like with the books where you understand the expectations of your subgenre, the tropes, what emotional experience readers are looking for. And then you can deliver that in unique ways that surprise them while still giving them what they're looking for. Right. I think it's so important being careful looking at traditional covers because you're right. A lot of traditional covers will, especially in romance, they'll have, they'll have images that are kind of just out of nowhere, but people will say, well, I write like Nora Roberts or I write like James Patterson or, but you don't yet probably. And you're not those people. So you need to look especially if you're indie published, you really need to look more at indie published books. I think that's really smart, really smart. What assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? I think I assumed that you could be successful with a book or a couple books mm-hmm. in the beginning. And the money is really in the backlist and your catalog and the sell through that really unlocks most of the marketing strategies and tactics and possibilities that you can employ to yeah. scale up. It's very difficult to write that mega bestseller, especially as an indie author, but that would be one assumption that didn't really play out. Another one was the scalability and controllability of the ads. So talking about things like Amazon ads, Facebook ads, BookBub ads, the assumption that I had was that those were somewhat infinitely scalable to a degree where you can just keep cranking them up, but it's not that easy. And it's also, you run into other problems where you don't have as much control Mm -hmm. as you might think 
with certain platforms with Facebook, you can run into approval issues and your account getting suspended and stuff like that. With Amazon, you run into issues where the ads don't necessarily serve or the bids in say romance are so high that it's really difficult to compete and get any sort of scale. Mm-hmm. Bookbub is smaller, so you can't scale to the degree you might like without the ads burning out. So that was one thing where I was coming in and saying, Hey, like, I think that this is the best way to build my business. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. It just, the underlying assumptions where it would be smooth and scaling up is really the easiest way to do things with the ad spend. That's not necessarily going to be the case. It's often presented that way in courses or by the ads platforms, you know, Mm -hmm. they have an incentive to say, Hey, this is the way you reach a ton of people and you definitely can, but there's so many challenges along the way that it's actually one of the hardest things to do spending a lot of money relatively efficiently. So Mm -hmm. that was one thing that didn't pan out. And I think over time, like most of my early assumptions, it's hard to think back and get in that mindset, but probably Mm -hmm. most of them were either incorrect or have been adjusted Mm -hmm. over time The other thing is that everyone assumes that they're going to be the one to buck all the trends, right? Yeah. Or they're going to be the one who, you know, all the other people wrote that one book and weren't successful, but mine (laughs) is the one. And I think you have to have a certain level of, let's call it self-delusion at the beginning, Mm -hmm. because you're taking a big leap in assuming that, hey, people want to read this story that I made up by myself in my room. Like mm-hmm. these are my thoughts that I wrote down and we're going to put them mm-hmm. out there. So it, it takes that at the beginning. And then over time, I think you have to, if you want to be a full-time author or part-time author and run it as a business, you have to kind of course correct a little bit mm-hmm. as you get feedback and as things do go your way and as things don't go your way, as many mm-hmm. things will in this business mm-hmm. inevitably. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point that like the assumptions, I think I've, I feel that like if you can, there's an assumption, like if you feel you can get the correct ad or the correct, whatever it is and scale it up, then you'll be set. And that's, I think that's really good just to hear that that doesn't always work. In most cases it doesn't, you know, there's kind of this thought that like ads are the magic pill or whatever, really like the, the magic button that will help you sell, you know, 10 times more books. And that's not always the case. It may help you sell more, but I think that's a very realistic mm-hmm. assessment, you know, and, you know, so many of us have learned that, learned that ourselves the hard way. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Yeah. I'd say, quite a few of them you learn the most when you make mistakes and then you analyze them so i don't Mm -hmm. really spend a lot of time at this point lamenting something that i did that was incorrect or Mm -hmm. didn't go the way that i wanted it to because you can almost inevitably see something positive an example Mm -hmm. recently was i didn't put the newsletter link in the back matter or front matter of my new book. So it's actually still not up there. I have to write a bonus scene or whatever, but I don't actually have to write the bonus scene. I should put the link in and then change the link to the bonus scene later. These are kind of the games we play with ourselves. I can't Mm -hmm. do this until I've done that, but (laughs) you know, in the meantime, I'm losing a few subscribers for sure every week because the book's selling 20, 30 copies a day, whatever. So I'm not capitalizing on that success and I'm not capitalizing on the ad spend that I'm putting into it. And all those readers are kind of just not going to join my newsletter because of that, because they're not, they don't know it exists, Mm -hmm. right? Like we have a very good idea of what books we've written and what's part of our ecosystem and all the places that readers can find out more about us and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But 
the reader doesn't know that. And some people will be interested in finding out and kind of diving down the Google rabbit hole or wherever they want to find out more, but that's not going to be most people, but a lot more people are going to be interested or sign up for updates or follow your future books and learn about those. If you say, Hey, here's how to do it. You give them that next action. So that's so critical. And that's something at this point, I obviously know to do, but there are many things that we know to do that we then do not do. And it's tempting not to do them because there's always examples that we can point at in our genre or outside our genre where mm-hmm. someone does everything really non-optimally and has this explosive success. And we almost want to be that person where it's like, well, I didn't even try. And this is just, you know, this kind of mm-hmm. happened over here, I think is oftentimes the subconscious thing lurking beneath the surface there yeah. for why we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot or don't do certain things. But yeah. that's an example. But the, the flip side of that is that it shows very clearly that it's important to a marketing tool mm-hmm. where you directly are not going to find it otherwise. Mm-hmm. And you can see that in the, the numbers mm-hmm. sold thousand plus copies of the book. I think six or seven people joined my list yeah. over the course of the month or 40 days and a bunch of people borrowed in Kindle Unlimited. So just not getting those people onto the list and yeah. same thing with directing people to the next book mm-hmm. in the back matter. You need to do that as well. It's going to increase sell through. So sometimes people ask me questions about that and they say, Hey, you know, I don't think that this makes a difference. One, it's free, mm-hmm. but two, it definitely does. Like I can tell you from my own numbers and learning from other people's experience and other people's numbers is always a lot less painful than finding it out for yourself. So that's just one example, but there are, I mean, there's gotta be dozens right. of digits at this point. probably. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Same, same. Yeah, exactly. Well, what mm-hmm. about the opposite? Have you ever had something you thought this is going to be a home run and it just didn't pan out? Yeah, a lot of things, certainly. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd say the last series that I launched before this one, I was really expecting that to do super well, but mm-hmm. my expectations weren't calibrated to reality. Mm-hmm. So I launched it at 99 cents and I was expecting that book to make $5,000, $10,000 or something in that month. And it did fine, but when you're selling a book for 99 cents and you only have one of them and the second's on pre-order, then you're using a loss leader strategy. So you have to understand kind of what the numbers are behind the strategy and what you're actually doing when you employ a promotional strategy, a launch tactic, use a certain ads platform. And it just takes time to understand what each tool does and how the numbers fit in for Mm -hmm. sure. But that's a situation where I was expecting that to just take off. And I had put in a ton of effort into just writing the books. There are hundred thousand plus words or the first oh, one wow. was, and then yeah. the, the next one was shorter, but I wanted to write the book longer to hopefully get more Kindle unlimited reads. I'd really spent a lot of money on the covers up front. I was expecting, that's another thing I was expecting the more expensive covers to convert better with the ads and to sell more books. And they did fine for sure. But I found that really with a professional cover, most of the benefits you're probably going to max out at around three, $400. That's not to say that the design can't be better at a higher rate. It's just Mm -hmm. that you're not getting a ton of marketing help from that additional spend. So there may be reasons to do it, but the marketing side, that was surprising to me. And that series uh, didn't end up doing well because I ended up canceling the pre-order. So that's one thing where when things don't go your way or you have these expectations, sometimes it can lead you to kind of hunker down and turtle a little bit or not do 
the thing that you need to do, which is usually write the next book. Right. So if I had gotten that next book out, I think things would have been okay. They wouldn't have been a smash hit, but they would have been okay because it would have kept building momentum. Mm -hmm. Like the pre-order numbers looked good, but I was expecting the pre-orders to be way higher than I know now, three years later, that they would never be that high. Yes. But it's hard because everyone's on an island. And right. even if you're talking with other authors, you are always somewhat uncertain about where your numbers fit in and what's good, what's mm -hmm. bad. And you see all sorts of things in groups and in forums and stuff like that, that may or may not be accurate. So it can be tricky and you can sometimes have your expectations end up really hurting you because you're like, this is a failure. I'm going to stop or I'm going to delay what I should be doing. So, right. Yeah. I think it's the expectations that get us because like you said, we think we're going to hit a certain level or that certain things will happen. If we do X, we'll get Y or whatever. So, and a lot of the stuff that's out there is we may not have the whole story. We may not know, you know, what people are doing behind the scenes mm -hmm. to get certain results. So it is, it is hard to kind of manage all that. And if we can keep all that in mind, <laughs> that's easier to deal with things than when they don't go, you know, the way we thought they would. So well, what's the sure. biggest, what's the biggest mindset change you've had to make during your career? Just thinking more long-term. Mm. This is such a long game and is, people yeah. really, at, especially at the beginning, you're, usually most people are hoping that their first book is going to do well. And then they're quickly dissuaded of that by this early sales numbers. Cause you don't know how to market the book. The book itself probably isn't great. Even if it is great, it's probably not on genre. So it's very rare to have someone come in and get all those right at the beginning. I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I just say that 99.999% of people, there's no way that that's going to happen, but in three years from now, five years from now, you can use what you learned from that first release. And then the second one, third mm -hmm. one, and in five years, you have 10 books, 20 books, 30 books, 40 books, however quickly you write. And all of a sudden your marketing options really expand and you have assets, which means that you have things that you can sell without really a ton of additional Effort. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to market them, but you don't have to rewrite the book and redo right. the work every time you sell it. So there's just tremendous leverage in that banked work. And that's the main thing that separates authors and other artists from, say, a nine to five or something like that, where you have to show up or consulting or when I'm managing the ads for someone or something mm -hmm. like that. I have to be there and the money can be good up front, but there's no way to say, hey, I'd like to get paid for that work I did two years ago. It's, mm -hmm. it's done and I can certainly use the skills and the takeaways that I learned to hopefully improve results going forward, but there's no actual asset there that I can sell right. and use without spending additional time managing ads for people. And I think that one of the best things about being an author is that you can do it for 30, 40, 50 years. It's one of the very few professions where you can get better over mm -hmm. time and be continually rewarded mm -hmm. over time. If you're an athlete, you generally have a 15, 20 year career mm -hmm. max. If you're a musician, that's certainly something that becomes more difficult as you age because it's hard to tour. And also a lot of the business is going to skew toward younger artists. That's not the case with writing. Mm -hmm. You can continually use all the things that you've learned and consistently build over time so that you're much better 10 years from now than you were at the start. And you have the books as well. So I think that that is really overlooked where if you want to do this as a full-time author and make this your career, you're not, you don't need it to happen in two years or two months or right. five, even five years. Mm -hmm. If you want to do this, like you're probably going to be doing it for 30, 
40 years and right. you want to kind of have that perspective. That's not to say just sit back and expect everything to happen by itself. That's not going to be the case. You right. need a little bit of urgency there, but I think urgency can quickly morph into panic where it's like, Oh, this launch did something that I don't like. It's all over this promo bomb. Just, yeah. Yeah. I sent out the wrong newsletter link, all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you zoom out to the actual length of your career, all that stuff becomes pretty inconsequential. The main thing that becomes important is chaining it all together by consistently releasing, getting better at your craft, right. getting better at the marketing aspects, particularly the fundamentals, like learning your genre, mm -hmm. understanding branding, learning how to communicate with readers via your newsletter stuff like that. So that was something that I really didn't have a concept of when I was coming in to writing. I was thinking, how am I going to make money in the next month or right. three months? Right. If I was being really, you know, thinking long-term three months, right. But yes. it's, it's so much longer than that. Yes. And you just want to think how much, more you can make potentially if you employ that mindset because all of your books as well, they're intellectual property and you can sell those in a variety of ways, translations, right. audio, video games, other media, TV shows, <laughs> etc. And especially with NFTs, non-fungible tokens, making a splash now, mm -hmm. that's, that's another potential revenue stream going forward. That's probably not going to look like it does now. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to become a lot more practical rather than people selling images of, you know, GIFs online that you can already download. And I think that there are going to be so many ways to employ that IP going forward that just weren't possible even today as we're recording this, that wow. building that and just having that base of content is so important because if you have the base of content, maybe you can't sell it now. Maybe you don't know how to market it now. Maybe the market isn't exactly right for it now, but mm -hmm. if you have it and it's good, then that is something that you can use later on, but only if you keep working and keep releasing. Right. And don't get hung up on that release that didn't work out or that, you know, or that promo that didn't work out. Yeah. I think that's, Good advice. So this is a good place to kind of segue into branding because you mentioned it. So what is your definition of branding? Like I, you've put out a series of emails. Um, I know because I'm on your email list uh, about branding, but tell us what your definition of branding is. It's just the promise of a consistent customer experience. Yeah. And that's going to be two things, the quality of the product itself and the emotional experience, mm -hmm. which is, really most of what dictates quality with something like a book or a television show, a movie, mm -hmm. a song. It's, it's about how you make the person feel and how they feel at the end mm -hmm. of consuming it. And hopefully over time, it's definitely an iterative process. It's not like you say, Hey, here's my brand. And then 20 years from now, you're like, yep, that was my brand. You start with an idea of what you're providing readers, mm -hmm. the experience that you're giving them. And then you refine that or you scrap it entirely if it's off base. But just as an example, Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts both sell coffee, but mm -hmm. those two brands are very different. The coffee might even taste fairly similar, but the experience of being in a Starbucks with the music they play and the way that they've engineered the layout so that you can kind of see all the machines and everything like that. It's just very different than the Dunkin' mood. Donuts. The mood is different yeah. in the Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And it's going to appeal to different people. So there's no right or wrong way necessarily mm -hmm. to do it. You have to understand what market you're trying to appeal to mm -hmm. and what they're interested in, because there are people who love Starbucks, but hate Dunkin' Donuts and, vice versa. And it has very little to do, I'd say, with the product itself, because there's only so many ways you can really 
make coffee. Mm-hmm. I know coffee lovers will probably disagree with me <laughs> there, but like the underlying product has certain properties that you can't really change all that much. And it's the same with the books. If you're writing a space opera, you need some spaceships in there and all this sort of thing. You're not just writing about dragons and whatever, and then calling it a space opera that doesn't work. So mm-hmm. that's where you start. And then you del- you try to figure out what you're delivering in your space opera or whatever you're writing that differentiates you from mm-hmm. everyone else. So branding is really trying to avoid becoming a commodity mm-hmm. where people flip past your book and they say, Oh, I, kind of liked that author. Oh, that looks like an urban fantasy book. I guess I'll buy it. You want people to really, that may be the initial reason they buy it Mm -hmm. at the beginning to try you out. But then hopefully it's something where they sign up for your list, become a fan. and They can only get that specific reading experience and emotional experience from you as an author, but it takes time to figure out what that is, what your niche is, within your genre, what genre you might fit in because your voice might be a better fit for a certain subgenre than another one. My voice is probably a better fit for urban fantasy since it's going to tend to be a little bit sarcastic or have a little bit of a bite to it. Mm -hmm. That's not usually the tone and voice that's used in a lot of sci-fi books. It can be, but it's just a little bit trickier to thread that needle Mm -hmm. and you find things like that by reading, obviously, but also just experimenting and seeing what people have to say and how they're responding and kind of iterate from there. Right. Right. Yeah. I always say that I want, I want people to, you know, when people buy my book, they get a Jamie Albright book, like a Jamie Albright book delivers these things. And I know they deliver these things because that's what I put in the books and I do it intentionally so um but it does take a while to figure out what those things are and and how they fit in your genre well in one of your emails you said maintaining the consistency of the reader experience can be approached in two primary ways writing only one genre under a pen name e.g urban only urban fantasy or using the genre as an umbrella genre that binds your catalog together e.g uh, urban fantasy could be straight up urban fantasy or it could be incorporated it could incorporate tropes and expectations from epic fantasy western sci-fi etc to change the flavor completely can you talk about that and and like um how that pertains to like writing with under a pen name and um how you can use a pen name in branding Yeah. So a lot of people want to write in multiple genres. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to brand that all under one name because Mm -hmm. it's akin to having Coke. And then if Sprite, instead of being its separate brand was like Coke Sprite or whatever, (laughs) which sounds ludicrous, the point of not being worth mentioning. Right. But that's what a lot of people are inadvertently doing. And the problem is that a lot of successful authors or a few successful authors who are very prominent Mm -hmm. do that. So we have the idea that that's the norm. Someone like Stephen King, for example, he's Mm -hmm. probably the most famous author in the world or maybe second to JK Rowling. Mm -hmm. They're one and two Stephen King. He genre hops. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's worked out very well for him. But if you look at quite a few other authors, say James Patterson, Mm -hmm. He's not writing fantasy books or sci-fi books. Mm -hmm. They're all thrillers and mysteries. And Lee Childs, Lee Child actually only has one character, Mm -hmm. one series, Jack Reacher. So you can obviously have quite a few characters. And that's something that I would recommend because it gives you more marketing options. But when you actually drill down, most of the successful authors who are traditionally published or indie published often are pretty focused on one genre or related genres like crime, mystery, thriller. Those can all exist under the same end name. So it just makes it a lot easier for the reader to know what they're getting. They don't have to study what your new book is about. The less friction there is between a purchase, Mm -hmm. the better. And what people are doing is they're creating this massive amount of friction when they're like, I'm going to write this historical novel and then I'm going to hop over here to 
post-apocalyptic and then I'm going to jump into literary and all this stuff. And that may be satisfying as an author, but if you want to make money, you're not writing for yourself. You're writing for other people. It'd be like going to a restaurant and someone ordering a hamburger and then the waiter comes back with salmon. Maybe you like salmon, maybe you don't, but it's not necessarily what you order. So a lot of people that happens with the brand Mm-hmm. as well, where sometimes people brand things incorrectly, where they say, hey, this is the genre I'm writing, and then it doesn't end up actually being that. Um, but certainly there's that question too, when you genre hop, sometimes mm-hmm. people will buy a book who are your fans who are expecting a certain experience, and then they're disappointed because it's not that way. So the easiest way to do that is just to write a single pen name mm-hmm. uh, or write a single genre per pen name. And then you could have multiple pen names. Each pen name is like its own business. So it's hard enough to get kind of one business up and running and feed it enough Mm -hmm. books to sustain it. But Mm -hmm. very few people can do two or three. And then incorporating other tropes and expectations from the genres that you want to write. So you could write an urban fantasy book that is set in space and has all those elements of a space but it's tied in either to your world, meaning like you might have an overarching story world that a lot of your books share, or it just has some vampires in it and things like that, those urban fantasy tropes that are going to appeal to your core readership. And not everybody will jump over to the things that are kind of cross-genre, but by maintaining that consistent thread, you can really maintain a a lot more consistency in the reader's experience, Mm -hmm. but B get a lot more cross sell through between Mm -hmm. your catalog, which is critical for having a long-term career because if people aren't jumping between your series and buying your other books, then you have a problem, which is Mm -hmm. generally what happens when you write in different sub genres Right. Readers have specific tastes. They may buy the book because your name is on the cover. Certainly if some people will do that, but even those people who are inclined to buy the book because your name is on the cover, they mm-hmm. generally want that mm-hmm. specific genre of book yeah. from you or some riff on it. Really deviating from that a lot, you're going to lose a lot of your fan base for that a release and if you can then you kind of lose their interest entirely where you have a bunch of books and they don't know where you're going with the subgenre they don't really feel like you're the author that is writing the things that they want to read and then they can just lose interest and some people are going to lose interest anyway it's mm-hmm. not a big deal yeah. it's just the way things work but certainly you want to keep as many people on board who liked your stuff as possible. So yeah, absolutely. That's one way to do it um, with the umbrella genre that I like. And it's a little bit tricky to pull off in something like romance. It's easier in something like urban fantasy mm-hmm. or thrillers or mystery. But yeah. yeah. I think that's a really good point because that's like your, you know, everyone always talks about staying your, your lane, but it lets you, produce something that's similar, but a little bit different. And it gives you kind of a different change of pace. So I think that's some really good, good advice. And we also, it's a good time to ask you about productivity because to to have a long-term career and write lots of books, you know, that you need to be productive and able to juggle a lot of different things. So do you have any, like, what would be for somebody for productivity? I think one of the most important things is to understand what needs to be consistent and what doesn't. And many things actually fall in the latter category. Whereas in productivity land, almost everything is treated as you have to be consistent. You have to wake up at whatever, like, you know, most of it's nonsense that the (laughs) author themselves doesn't actually do (laughs) or did for two weeks and then wrote about it. (laughs) Wrote a book about it. (laughs) You know, like that is usually the case. So with the consistent stuff, 
you have to be consistent with your diet. You have to be consistent with your exercise. Otherwise you're not going to get any results. You can't bank that work where you work out for eight hours and then you're like, I'm good for the next month. Everything's set up. I can draw on that. That's just not the way it works. So you have to be consistent there. And a lot of people try to be really inconsistent or try to do things in bulk that need to be consistent, like Mm -hmm. crash dieting and going to the gym for two weeks and then stopping. So conversely, they try to be consistent in areas where you actually don't need to be consistent. Certainly consistency can help, but the it's held up as the ideal and it's not necessarily going to be right for everyone. So the most pertinent example in authordom is writing every day. Mm -hmm. That's really held up as the gold standard. And you got to write every day. You got to be consistent there. But as we talked about earlier, your books are assets. You can actually bank those and bank that work. Mm -hmm. So you may not work best writing every day. You may work much better writing for five days, seven days, 14 days, finishing a book, and then taking a couple weeks off for however long you need to recharge and then coming back to it. Or you might work really well banging out 3000 words a day or 500 words a day or whatever your daily quota is, you can do either. And it's worth experimenting with multiple different approaches. But what I'll say from my own experience is that I'm at this point, not a consistent author. Mm -hmm. I'm consistent in working out and stuff like that. I don't have any sort of problem with that, but when it comes to writing, it's not something that I do every day. And I actually write better books when I have a very specific deadline and then write them in a short period of time. Because otherwise, if I'm writing a thousand words a day or something like that, then I get to 10,000 words, 20,000 words. I'm like, I don't know what happened. I can't remember what's going on. Whereas that intense sprint to the finish forces me to keep building momentum and it doesn't allow me to forget, which is so important personally for me, like, because the plot continuity gets all over the place with the consistent approach. Mm -hmm. And then I have to spend a lot more time ironing that out. So there's a lot of things in productivity that people say you should do. You don't have to do basically any of them. You really have to experiment a lot, but it really starts with that principle. Does this have to be consistent or can I be inconsistent and bank that progress Mm -hmm. in some way? And it's a continuum. So Mm -hmm. something like probably playing an instrument is going to be more toward the consistent side, but maybe you don't have to do that every day. Or maybe another thing with the consistency thing is it doesn't mean every day. Mm -hmm. So you could work out every day, but then you don't give your body any time to recover. Mm -hmm. So you have to calibrate that way as well, building in rest, even if something needs to be consistent. Right. Right. That's very good. Very good. So you have mentioned a couple of times about running ads, you run ads for people and you have, um, you had an ads course and, you, we can find everybody can find all that on your website and everything. But um, what are the biggest mistakes you see authors making with ads? Probably spending too much too yeah. soon. Yeah, just assuming that it's going to be the silver bullet. Mm-hmm. It's pretty challenging to run the ads profitably. The story is that it's going to be the catalyst for your career, mm-hmm. but like through mm-hmm. in in place so you need a uh, you can sell people multiple books otherwise it's very hard to be competitive with mm-hmm. the bids especially on something like amazon ads where the bids are extremely high it's difficult yeah. to do that without sell through there are always outliers where people have written standalones in certain genres that they're profitable on but for the most part you're looking at sell through so you need some books to do it and you also need the books to convert which is when you send someone to the Amazon page, mm-hmm. it's not a given that they're going to buy. You could be getting 10 cent clicks to Amazon, but if your blurb or your cover is a little bit off, mm-hmm. or sometimes people read the look inside, I'd say that the blurb and the cover are going to be more 
factors in conversion, just because a book is more of an impulse buy for most people. So if they like those, then most people will buy it or add it to their wish list or something. Mm -hmm. But if those are off, then it's really easy for someone to click away from the page because the Amazon page itself has hundreds of different ads and products on it. Facebook, they've seen hundreds of ads today. So you really got to make sure that those are on point. And a lot of times they're not. The sell-through tends to be the biggest problem. And I don't mean the sell-through from book one to book two, where 40% of people go on to book two or whatever. I mean, the total value Mm -hmm. of people reading through your series. If someone buying book one is actually worth $5 to you, that's going to give you a lot more latitude with the ads than if you have to make a profit on a three ninety nine book that you get, I think two seventy for mm-hmm. around there about two eighty two seventy. So it just gives you a lot more room to play with. Same thing. If you have a 10 book series or something, and it's you have $10 in value, $12 mm-hmm. in value for every book, one sale that unlocks so many possibilities yeah. that you can't defeat the math. That's what people try to do. It's certainly something that I've experimented with a lot. <laughs> you just can't do it. Yeah. The other mistake that people make with the ads is that, especially on something like Facebook, it's really mostly about the creative. Mm-hmm. So that's not going to be the case on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, book above the creative is important, but certainly Facebook. It's going to dictate a lot of your success there. And just testing a lot of different creatives is really going to be your key to scaling and maintaining good ad performance. And I mentioned testing. So that's the thing that most people know they should do, but don't. That applies to all the platforms. It really applies to marketing in general. You should be testing and then keeping records of what worked and what Mm -hmm. didn't. And then hopefully you can build on that. But with the ads, it's so critical to test so much and people really underestimate the amount that you have to test. For example, with the BookBub ads, when I say test a lot, people might think, okay, I'm going to test two ads and six audiences. I'm talking you're testing 10 ads and hundred audiences yeah, or 150 audiences on BookBub and on BookBub, the audience is pretty much the main factor in the success, the creative matters, but the audience, that's the main driver of the success. So you have to test so much more than you think. And the sooner you jump down that rabbit hole, the sooner you get results and also build your skills with the ads platform, because there's no way to think your way out of this problem. Mm -hmm. You're like, Oh, I think readers will like that. And then they're like, Nope, we hated that. But we like this thing over here that you didn't like at all. And it gives you a tremendous amount of insight, not just into what readers respond to, but also how little control you have over a lot of things besides (laughs) actually just doing the work. So you don't have a lot of control over a specific ads performance, Mm -hmm. how a specific book is going to convert or anything like that. You just test it and see what the numbers are and then go from there. And that applies to when you're launching a new series, you can put in the work up front, you can test the covers, you can test the blurb, you can put together a great launch plan and all that sort of thing, but you don't have a ton of control over Mm -hmm. the end rank or how much money that book is going to make, how many people are going to sell through to your other books in the series or your catalog, what the reviews are going to be like. And that's what everyone tends to focus on. And it's not that those things aren't important. They're just important as feedback to incorporate later on, but people obsess over those and try to control those things that they can't, whereas they often don't control the things that they can, which is Mm -hmm. writing the books and getting them out or testing the ads and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you can't think your way out of these problems. Believe me, I've tried the best (laughs) course of action, especially with the ads and just the books in general is to test things, Mm -hmm. have a theory of what's going to work and then see what the data says and don't necessarily believe wholesale in the data. Sometimes there are quirks or anomalies or, Mm -hmm. you know, just a random outlier, 
but also don't insist that you're right, especially when you're starting to see a pattern. When you see a pattern and you're still doing the same thing, that's definitely a time to adjust course, but mm -hmm. test. That's the key to marketing. Yeah. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I think that will help a lot of people. Yeah. It kind of takes a it demystifies them a little bit because I think there's an air, uh, a feeling that, you know, that there's like the secret thing that you can do, or, you know, there's like secret tricks that you can do with ads. And a lot of it is just hard work and keeping records. Testing. I think that's important testing and keeping records. Yeah. So I think that's very, very good to point out. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success? I think just shifting toward that long-term mindset mm -hmm. and also just kind of adjusting from, okay, I know this is going to work, or I think this is going to work to let's test this seems subtle, but when you have your ego involved with it, which is usually what happens when you're like, Oh, I think this is going to work. Like, I really hope this is going to work then it sets up these expectations and you have this emotional investment. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're just like, Hey, let's test this. Then it's, it's like, all right, didn't yeah. work. And we can move on. So I think that that's been key to moving forward. I think last year, one thing that I did was I just tried to do as much with the ads as possible, work with as many clients as possible, and just gathered a lot of data, a lot of insight on what was working, what wasn't, and really jumped into that. Uh, and wasn't writing any fiction or anything like that last year. So the power of focusing on a single thing or a couple of different things is really, really underrated. I'd say at the beginning of your career, you're juggling a lot of different balls and trying to get multiple things up to a professional level or get them to a point where you have everything in place with the marketing, you know, you need your website and your newsletter and all that type of stuff. And that's overwhelming. But at some point you can switch over to not exclusive specialization, but where you're really focused on learning one thing well. And there's so much value in that right now, I've been really working on the Amazon ads mm -hmm. quite a bit. And it's remarkable how much I've found out about that platform by focusing on it rather than spreading my attention between all the other various mm -hmm. marketing options, whether those are other ad platforms or, you know, cross promos or all that type of stuff. There's so much benefit to really mastering a tool. And mm -hmm. I was good with the Amazon ads before and people have paid me and pay me currently to run them, but by really, narrowing that focus down. It was tremendous. And I think people overestimate a, how much usable energy and usable focus they have in a given day. People generally have more time, even if you're really busy, than energy yeah. and good work hours. Yeah. And the more you can narrow that down, kind of like the sun going through a magnifying glass, mm -hmm you often make a lot quicker progress. So by splitting your time between, let's say, just using ad platforms as an example, Facebook and Amazon, that's what a lot of people do, or they throw BookBub into the mix and try to learn all three at once. Mm -hmm. You make really much slower progress than if you focus on one and try to get the principles down, see if it works for your books and give it an actual good attempt. And then maybe six months later, you do Facebook. And then maybe by the end of the year, you have a good grasp of both rather than at the end of the year, you're kind of like, well, I don't know what works for my books. I don't know right. which of these is good. And I think a lot of that comes from impatience and just not. And a little really, desperation, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 And I just, yep. do that. I do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, we all do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, this has just been so great, Nick. I appreciate you so much coming on. Uh, tell people where they can find you. You can check out my website at nicholaseric.com. That's Eric with a K. And you can also pick up the Ultimate Guide to Book Marketing 
on Amazon and other retailers. If you want like a comprehensive guide to book marketing on one place. So those are the two places I'd go. I have a weekly marketing newsletter that's free mm-hmm. on my site. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat weekly, <laughs> occasionally <laughs> weekly. We'll say that. And, uh, it's kind of like my occasionally monthly newsletter. I send out to my readers. Most of the yeah. time it goes out. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and we'll have all the links in the show notes and um, we can find, you can find those at wish I'd known then podcast.com. And um, thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye everyone. Bye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the wish I'd known then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, Tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.